Hello friends and welcome to this edition of Sleep Stories. Tonight I shall read for you four stories by Beatrix Potter, in which we follow the adventures of Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny. Shortcuts to each chapter can be found in the description below. It is time to unwind. Find a place where you can comfortably relax. Your bed or maybe your comfortable chair. Settle into that place. Take a deep breath and let's begin these stories. The Tale of Peter Rabbit Once upon a time there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sandbank underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now, my dears, said old Mrs. Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down the lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. Your father had an accident there. He was put in a pie by Mrs. McGregor. Now run along and don't get into mischief. I am going out. Then old Mrs. Rabbit took a basket and her umbrella and went through the wood to the baker's. She bought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, who were good little bunnies, went down the lane to gather blackberries. But Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First he ate some lettuce and some French beans, and then he ate some radishes. And then, feeling rather sick, he went to look for some parsley. But round the end of a cucumber frame, whom should he meet? but Mr. McGregor. Mr. McGregor was on his hands and knees, planting out young cabbages. But he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, Stop, thief! Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. He lost one of his shoes among the cabbages, and the other shoe amongst the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs and went faster, so that I think he might have got away altogether if he had not, unfortunately, run into a gooseberry net and got caught by the large buttons on his jacket. It was a blue jacket, with brass buttons, quite new. Peter gave himself up for lost, and shed big tears, but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows, who flew to him in great excitement, and implored him to exert himself. Mr. McGregor came up with a sieve, which he intended to pop upon the top of Peter. But Peter wriggled out just in time, leaving his jacket behind him, and rushed into the tool shed and jumped into a can. It would have been a beautiful thing to hide in, if it had not had so much water in it. Mr. McGregor was quite sure that Peter was somewhere in the tool shed, perhaps hidden underneath a flower pot began to turn them over carefully, looking under each. Presently Peter sneezed. Curty-choo! 
Mr. McGregor was after him in no time, and tried to put his foot upon Peter, who jumped out of a window, upsetting three plants. The window was too small for Mr. McGregor, and he was tired of running after Peter. He went back to his work. Peter sat down to rest. He was out of breath and trembling with fright, and he had not the least idea which way to go. Also, he was very damp with sitting in that can. After a time, he began to wander about, going lippity-lippity, not very fast, and looking all round. He found a door in a wall, but it was locked, and there was no room for a fat little rabbit to squeeze underneath. An old mouse was running in and out over the stone doorstep, carrying peas and beans to her family in the wood. Peter asked her the way to the gate, but she had such a large pea in her mouth that she could not answer. She only shook her head at him. Peter began to cry. Then he tried to find his way straight across the garden, but he became more and more puzzled. Presently he came to a pond, where Mr. McGregor filled his water cans. A white cat was staring at some goldfish. She sat very, very still but now and then the tip of her tail twitched, as if it were alive. Peter thought it best to go away without speaking to her. He had heard about cats from his cousin, little Benjamin Bunny. He went back towards the tool shed, but suddenly, quite close to him, he heard the noise of a hoe. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Scratch! Peter scudded underneath the bushes, but presently, as nothing happened, he came out and climbed upon a wheelbarrow and peeped over. The first thing he saw was Mr. McGregor hoeing onions. His back was turned towards Peter, and beyond him was the gate. Peter got down very quietly off the wheelbarrow and started running as fast as he could go along a straight walk behind some black currant bushes. Mr. McGregor caught sight of him at the corner. But Peter did not care. He slipped underneath the gate and was safe at last in the wood outside the garden. Mr. McGregor hung up the little jacket and the shoes for a scarecrow to frighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looked behind him till he got home to the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down upon the nice soft sand on the floor of the rabbit hole and shut his eyes. His mother was busy cooking. She wondered what he had done with his clothes. It was the second little jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in a fortnight. I am sorry to say that Peter was not very well during the evening. His mother put him to bed and made some chamomile tea, and she gave a dose of it to Peter one tablespoonful to be taken at bedtime. But Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. The Tale of Benjamin Bunny One morning a little rabbit sat on a bank. He pricked his ears and listened to the trit-trot, trit-trot of a pony. A gig was coming along the road. It was driven by Mr. McGregor, 
and beside him sat Mrs. MacGregor in her best bonnet. As soon as they had passed, little Benjamin Bunny slid down into the road and set off with a hop, skip, and a jump to call upon his relations who lived in the wood at the back of Mr. MacGregor's garden. That wood was full of rabbit holes, and in the neatest, sandiest hole of all lived Benjamin's aunt and his cousins, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. Old Mrs. Rabbit was a widow. She earned her living by knitting rabbit wool mittens and muffeties. I once bought a pair at a bazaar. She also sold herbs and rosemary tea and rabbit tobacco, which is what we call lavender. Little Benjamin did not very much want to see his aunt. He came round the back of the fir tree and nearly tumbled upon the top of his cousin Peter. Peter was sitting by himself. He looked poorly and was dressed in a red cotton pocket handkerchief. Peter, said little Benjamin in a whisper, who has got your clothes? Peter replied, the scarecrow in Mr. MacGregor's garden, and described how he had been chased about the garden and had dropped his shoes and coat. Little Benjamin sat down beside his cousin and assured him that Mr. MacGregor had gone out in a gig, and Mrs. MacGregor also, and certainly for the day, because she was wearing her best bonnet. Peter said he hoped that it would rain. At this point, old Mrs. Rabbit's voice was heard inside the rabbit hole, calling, Cottontail, Cottontail, fetch some more chamomile. Peter said he thought he might feel better if he went for a walk. They went away hand in hand and got up the flat top of the wall at the bottom of the wood. From here, they looked down into Mr. MacGregor's garden. Peter's coat and shoes were plainly to be seen upon the scarecrow, topped with an old tam o shanter of Mr. MacGregor's. Little Benjamin said, It spoils people's clothes to squeeze under a gate. The proper way to get in is to climb down a pear tree. Peter fell down head first, but it was of no consequence, as the bed below was newly raked and quite soft. It had been sewn with lattice. They left a great many odd little footmarks all over the bed, especially little Benjamin, who was wearing clogs. Little Benjamin said that the first thing to be done was to get back Peter's clothes, in order that they might be able to use the pocket handkerchief. They took them off the scarecrow. There had been rain during the night, and there was water in the shoes, and the coat was somewhat shrunk. Benjamin tried on the tam o' shanter, but it was too big for him. Then he suggested that they should fill the pocket handkerchief with onions as a little present for his aunt. Peter did not seem to be enjoying himself. He kept hearing noises. Benjamin, on the contrary, was perfectly at home and ate a lettuce leaf. He said that he was in the habit of coming to the garden with his father to get lettuces for their Sunday dinner. The name of little Benjamin's papa was old Mr. Benjamin Bunny. The lettuces certainly were very fine. Peter did not eat anything. 
he said he should like to go home. Presently he dropped half the onions. Little Benjamin said that it was not possible to get back up the pear tree with a load of vegetables. He led the way boldly towards the other end of the garden. They went along a little walk on planks under a sunny red brick wall. The mice sat on the doorsteps, cracking cherry stones. They winked at Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin Bunny. Presently, Peter let the pocket handkerchief go again. They got amongst flower pots and frames and tubs. Peter heard noises worse than ever. His eyes were as big as lollipops. He was a step or two in front of his cousin when he suddenly stopped. This is what those little rabbits saw round that corner. Little Benjamin took one look, and then, in half a minute, less than no time, he hid himself and Peter and the onions underneath a large basket. The cat got up and stretched herself, and came and sniffed at the basket. Perhaps she liked the smell of onions. Anyway, she sat down upon the top of the basket. She sat there for five hours. I cannot draw you a picture of Peter and Benjamin underneath the basket, because it was quite dark, and because the smell of onions was fearful. It made Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin cry. The sun got round behind the wood, and it was quite late in the afternoon. But still, the cat sat upon the basket. At length there was a pitter-patter, pitter-patter, and some bits of mortar fell from the wall above. The cat looked up and saw old Mr. Benjamin Bunny prancing along the top of the wall of the upper terrace. He was smoking a pipe of rabbit tobacco, and had a little switch in his hand. He was looking for his son. Old Mr. Bunny had no opinion whatever of cats. He took a tremendous jump off the top of the wall, on to the top of the cat, and cuffed it off the basket, and kicked it into the greenhouse, scratching off a handful of fur. The cat was too much surprised to scratch back. When old Mr. Bunny had driven the cat into the greenhouse, he locked the door. Then he came back to the basket and took out his son Benjamin by the ears and whipped him with the little switch. Then he took out his nephew Peter. Then he took out the handkerchief of onions and marched out of the garden. When Mr. McGregor returned about half an hour later, he observed several things which perplexed him. It looked as though some person had been walking all over the garden in a pair of clogs. Only the footmarks were too ridiculously little. Also, he could not understand how the cat could have managed to shut herself up inside the greenhouse, locking the door upon the outside. When Peter got home, his mother forgave him, because she was so glad to see that he had found his shoes and coat. Cottontail and Peter folded up the pocket handkerchief, and old Mrs. Rabbit strung up the onions and hung them from the kitchen ceiling with the bunches of herbs and the rabbit tobacco. The Tale of the Flopsy Bunnies It is said that the effect of eating too much lettuce is 
soporific. I have never felt sleepy after eating lettuce. But then, I am not a rabbit. They certainly had a very soporific effect upon the Flopsy Bunnies. When Benjamin Bunny grew up, he married his cousin Flopsy. They had a large family, and they were very improvident and cheerful. I do not remember the separate names of the children. They were generally called the Flopsy Bunnies. As there was not always quite enough to eat, Benjamin used to borrow cabbages from Flopsy's brother, Peter Rabbit, who kept a nursery garden. Sometimes Peter Rabbit had no cabbages to spare. When this happened, the Flopsy Bunnies went across the field to a rubbish heap in the ditch outside Mr. McGregor's garden. Mr. McGregor's rubbish heap was a mixture. There were jam pots and paper bags and mountains of chopped grass from the mowing machine, which always tasted oily, and some rotten vegetable marrows and an old boot or two. One day, Oh, joy, there were a quantity of overgrown lettuces, which had shot into flour. The Flopsy Bunnies simply stuffed lettuces. By degrees, one after another, they were overcome with slumber, and lay down in the mown grass. Benjamin was not so much overcome as his children. Before going to sleep, he was sufficiently wide awake to put a paper bag over his head to keep off the flies. The little Flopsy Bunnies slept delightfully in the warm sun. From the lawn beyond the garden came the distant, clackety sound of the mowing machine. The blue bottles buzzed about the wall, and a little old mouse picked over the rubbish among the jam pots. I can tell you her name. She was called Thomasina Tittlemouse, a wood mouse with a long tail. She rustled across the paper bag and awakened Benjamin Bunny. The mouse apologized profusely and said that she knew Peter Rabbit. While she and Benjamin were talking, close under the wall, they heard a heavy thread above their heads, and suddenly Mr. McGregor emptied out a sackful of lone mowings right upon the top of the sleeping Flopsy Bunnies. Benjamin shrank down under his paper bag. The mouse hid in a jam pot. The little rabbits smiled sweetly in their sleep under the shower of grass. They did not awake because the lettuce had been so, so poic. They dreamt that their mother, Flopsy, was tucking them up in a hay bed. Mr. McGregor looked down after emptying his sack. He saw some funny little brown tips of ears sticking up through the lawn mowings. He stared at them for some time. Presently, a fly settled on one of them, and it moved. Mr. McGregor climbed down onto the rubbish heap. One, two, three, four, five, six little rabbits, said he as he dropped them into his sack. The Flopsy Bunnies dreamt that their mother was turning them over in bed. They stirred a little in their sleep, but still, they did not wake up. Mr. McGregor tied up the sack and left it on the wall. He went to put away the mowing machine. While he was gone, Mrs. Flopsy Bunny, who had remained at home, came across the field. She looked suspiciously at the sack 
and wondered where everybody was. Then the mouse came out of her jam pot, and Benjamin took the paper bag off his head, and they told the doleful tale. Benjamin and Flopsy were in despair. They could not undo the string. But Mrs. Tittlemouse was a resourceful person. She nibbled a hole in the bottom corner of the sack. Their little rabbits were pulled out and pinched to wake them. Their parents stuffed the empty sack with three rotten vegetable marrows, an old blacking brush and two decayed turnips. Then they all hid under a bush and watched for Mr. McGregor. Mr. McGregor came back and picked up the sack and carried it off. He carried it hanging down as if it were rather heavy. The Flopsy Bunnies followed at a safe distance. They watched him go into the house, and they crept up to the window to listen. Mr. McGregor threw down the sack on the stone floor. In a way, that would have been extremely painful to the Flopsy Bunnies if they had happened to have been inside it. They could hear him drag his chair on the flags and chuckle. One, two, three, four, five, six little rabbits, said Mr. McGregor. Eh? What's that? What have they been spoiling now? inquired Mrs. McGregor. One, two, three, four, five, six little fat rabbits, repeated Mr. McGregor, counting on his fingers. One, two, three. Don't be silly. What do you mean, you silly old man? In the sack. One, two, three, four, five, six, replied Mr. McGregor. The youngest Flopsy Bunny got upon the windowsill. Mrs. McGregor took hold of the sack and felt it. She said she could feel sex, but there must be old rabbits, because they were so hard and all different shapes. Not fit to eat, but the skins will do fine to line my old cloak. Line your old cloak, shouted Mr. McGregor. I shall sell them and buy myself backy. Rabbit tobacco. I shall skin them and cut off their heads. Mrs. McGregor untied the sack and put her hand inside. When she felt the vegetables, she became very, very angry. She said that Mr. McGregor had done it a purpose. And Mr. McGregor was very angry too. One of the rotten marrows came flying through the kitchen window and hit the youngest Flopsy Bunny. It was rather hurt. Then Benjamin and Flopsy thought that it was time to go home. So Mr. McGregor did not get his tobacco, and Mrs. McGregor did not get her rabbit skins. But next Christmas, Thomasina Tittlemouse got a present of enough rabbit wool to make herself a cloak and a hood, and a handsome muff, and a pair of warm mittens. The Tale of Mr. Todd I have made many books about well-behaved people. Now, for a change, I am going to make a story about two disagreeable people, called Tommy Brook and Mr. Todd. Nobody could call Mr. Todd nice. The rabbits could not bear him. They could smell him half a mile off. He was a wandering habit, 
and he had foxy whiskers. They never knew where he would be next. One day he was living in a stick house in the coppice, causing terror to the family of old Mr. Benjamin Bouncer. Next day he moved into the pollard willow near the lake, frightening the wild ducks and the water rats. In winter and early spring he might generally be found in an earth amongst the rocks at the top of bull banks under oatmeal crag. He had half a dozen houses, but he was seldom at home. The houses were not always empty when Mr. Todd moved out, because sometimes Tommy Brock moved in without asking leave. Tommy Brock was a short, bristly, fat, waddling person with a grin. He grinned all over his face. He was not nice in his habits. He ate wasp nests and frogs and worms, and he waddled about by moonlight, digging things up. His clothes were very dirty, and as he slept in the daytime, he always went to bed in his boots. And the bed which he went to bed in was generally Mr. Todd's. Now, Tommy Brook did occasionally eat rabbit pie, but it was only very little, young ones occasionally, when other food was really scarce. He was friendly with old Mr. Bouncer. They agreed in disliking the wicked otters and Mr. Todd. They often talked over that painful subject. Old Mr. Bouncer was stricken in years. He sat in the springtime sunshine outside the burrow, in a muffler, smoking a pipe of rabbit tobacco. He lived with his son Benjamin Bunny and his daughter-in-law Flopsy, who had a young family. Old Mr. Bouncer was in charge of the family that afternoon, because Benjamin and Flopsy had gone out. The little rabbit babies were just old enough to open their blue eyes and kick. They lay in a fluffy bed of rabbit wool and hay. In a shallow burrow, separate from the main rabbit hole. To tell the truth, old Mr. Bouncer had forgotten them. He sat in the sun and conversed cordially with Tommy Brock who was passing through the wood with a sack and a little spud which he used for digging, and some mole traps. He complained bitterly about the scarcity of pheasants' eggs, and accused Mr. Todd of poaching them, and the otters had cleared off all the frogs while he was asleep in winter. I have not had a good square meal for a fortnight, I am living on pig nuts. I shall have to turn vegetarian and eat my own tail, said Tommy Brock. It was not much of a joke, but it tickled old Mr. Bouncer, because Tommy Brock was so fat and stumpy and grinning. So old Mr. Bouncer laughed and pressed Tommy Brock to come inside to taste a slice of seed cake and a glass of my daughter Flopsy's cowslip wine. Tommy Brock squeezed himself into the rabbit hole with alacrity. Then old Mr. Bouncer smoked another pipe and gave Tommy Brock a cabbage leaf cigar, which was so very strong that it made Tommy Brock grin more than ever, and the smoke filled the burrow. Old Mr. Bouncer coughed and laughed, and Tommy Brook puffed and grinned. And Mr. Bouncer laughed and coughed and shut his eyes because of the cabbage smoke. When Flopsy and Benjamin came back, old Mr. Bouncer woke up. Tommy Brook and all the young rabbit babies had disappeared. Mr. Bouncer would not confess 
that he had admitted anybody into the rabbit hole, but the smell of badger was undeniable, and there were round heavy footmarks in the sand. He was in disgrace. Flopsy wrung her ears and slapped him. Benjamin Bunny set off at once after Tommy Pock. There was not much difficulty in tracking him. He had left his footmark and gone slowly up the winding footpath through the wood. Here he had rooted up the moss and wood skull. There he had dug quite a deep hole for Doc Donnell, and had set a mole trap. A little stream crossed the way. Benjamin skipped lightly over dry foot. The badger's heavy steps slowed plainly in the mud. The path led to a part of the thicket where the trees had been cleared. There were leafy oak stumps and a sea of blue hyacinth. But the smell that made Benjamin stop was not the smell of flowers. Mr. Todd's thick house was before him, and for once Mr. Todd was at home. There was not only a foxy flavor in proof of it. There was smoke coming out of the broken pail that served as a chimney. Benjamin Bunny sat up, staring. His whiskers twitched. Inside the stick house, somebody dropped a plate and said something. Benjamin stamped his foot and bolted. He never stopped till he came to the other side of the wood. Apparently, Tommy Brock had turned the same way. Upon the top of the wall there were again the marks of badger, and some ravelings of a sack had caught on a briar. Benjamin climbed over the wall into the meadow. He found another mole trap newly set. He was still upon the track of Tommy Brock. It was getting late in the afternoon. Other rabbits were coming out to enjoy the evening air. One of them in a blue coat by himself was busily hunting for dandelions. Cousin Peter, Peter Rabbit, Peter Rabbit, shouted Benjamin Bunny. The blue-coated rabbit sat up with pricked ears. Whatever is the matter, Cousin Benjamin? Is it a cat, or John Stowe Ferret? No, no, no. He's bagged my family, Tommy Brock, in a sack. Have you seen him? Tommy Brock? How many, Cousin Benjamin? Seven, Cousin Peter, and all of them twins. Did he come this way? Please tell me quick. Yes, yes, not ten minutes since. He said they were caterpillars. I did think they were kicking rather hard for caterpillars. Which way? Which way has he gone, Cousin Peter? He had a sack with something live in it. I watched him set a mole trap. Let me use my mind, Cousin Benjamin. Tell me from the beginning. Benjamin did so. My Uncle Bouncer has displayed a lamentable want of discretion for his years, said Peter reflectively, but there are two hopeful circumstances. Your family is alive and kicking, and Tommy Brock has had refreshment. He will probably go to sleep and keep them for breakfast. Which way? Cousin Benjamin, compose yourself. I know very well which way. Because Mr. Todd was at home in the stick house, he has gone to Mr. Toad's other house, at the top of Bull Banks. I partly know, because he offered to leave any message at Sister Cottontail's. He said he would be passing. Cottontail had married a black rabbit and gone to live on the hill. Peter hid his dandelions and accompanied the afflicted parent, who was all of a twitter. They crossed several fields and began to climb the hill. The tracks of Tommy Brock were plainly to be seen. 
He seemed to have put down the sack every dozen yards to rest. He must be very puffed. We are close behind him by the scent. What a nasty person, said Peter. The sunshine was still warm and slanting on the hill pastures. Halfway up, Cottontail was sitting in the doorway, with four or five half-grown little rabbits playing about her. One black and the others brown. Cottontail had seen Tommy Brook passing in the distance. Asked whether her husband was at home, she replied that Tommy Brook had rested twice while she watched him. He had nodded and pointed to the sack, and seemed doubled up with laughing. Come away, Peter, he will be cooking them. Come quicker, said Benjamin Bunny. They climbed up and up. He was at home. I saw his black ears peeping out of the hole. They live too near the rocks to quarrel with their neighbors. Come on, Cousin Benjamin. When they came near the wood at the top of Bull Banks, they went cautiously. The trees grew amongst heaped-up rocks, and there, beneath a crag, Mr. Todd had made one of his homes. It was at the top of the steep bank, and rocks and bushes overhung it. The rabbits crept up carefully, listening and peeping. This house was something between a cave, a prison, and a tumble-down pigsty. There was a strong door, which was shut and locked. The setting sun made the window panes glow like red flame, but the kitchen fire was not alight. It was neatly laid with dry sticks, as the rabbits could see, when they peeped through the window. Benjamin sighed with relief, but there were preparations upon the kitchen table which made him shudder. There was an immense empty pie dish of blue willow pattern, and a large carving knife and fork, and a chopper. At the other end of the table was a partly unfolded tablecloth, a plate, a tumbler, a knife and fork, salt cellar, mustard and a chair, in short, preparations for one person's supper. No person was to be seen, and no young rabbits. The kitchen was empty and silent. The clock had run down. Peter and Benjamin flattened their noses against the window and stared into the dusk. Then they scrambled round the rocks to the other side of the house. It was damp and smelly, and overgrown with thorns and briars. The rabbits shivered in their shoes. Oh, my poor rabbit babies, what a dreadful place! I shall never see them again, sighed Benjamin. They crept up to the bedroom window. It was closed and bolted like the kitchen. But there were signs that this window had been recently opened. The cobwebs were disturbed, and there were fresh, dirty footmarks upon the window sill. The room inside was so dark that at first they could make out nothing, but they could hear a noise, a slow, deep, regular, snoring grunt. And as their eyes became accustomed to the darkness, they perceived that somebody was asleep on Mr. Todd's bed, curled up under the blanket. He has gone to bed in his boots, whispered Peter. Benjamin, who was all of a twitter, pulled Peter off the window sill. Tommy Brock's snores continued, grunty and regular from Mr. Toad's bed. Nothing could be seen of the young family. The sun had set, an owl began to hoot in the wood. There were many unpleasant things lying about that had much better have been buried. Rabbit bones and skulls and chicken legs and other horrors. It was a shocking place and very dark. They went back to the front of the house. 
and tried in every way to move the bolt of the kitchen window. They tried to push up a rusty nail between the window sashes, but it was of no use, especially without a light. They sat side by side outside the window, whispering and listening. In half an hour the moon rose over the wood. It shone full and clear and cold upon the house amongst the rocks and in at the kitchen window. But alas, no little rabbit babies were to be seen. The moonbeams twinkled on the carving knife and the pie dish and made a path of brightness across the dirty floor. The light showed a little door in a wall beside the kitchen fireplace, a little iron door belonging to a brick oven of that old-fashioned sort that used to be heated with faggots of wood. And presently, at the same moment, Peter and Benjamin noticed that whenever they shook the window, the little door opposite shook in answer. The young family were alive, shut up in the oven. Benjamin was so excited that it was a mercy he did not awake Tommy Brock, whose snores continued solemnly in Mr. Toad's bed. But there really was not very much comfort in the discovery. They could not open the window, and although the young family was alive, the little rabbits were quite incapable of letting themselves out. They were not old enough to crawl. After much whispering, Peter and Benjamin decided to dig a tunnel. They began to burrow a yard or two lower down the bank. They hoped that they might be able to work between the large stones under the house. The kitchen floor was so dirty that it was impossible to say whether it was made of earth or flax. They dug and dug for hours. They could not tunnel straight on account of stones. But by the end of the night they were under the kitchen floor. Benjamin was on his back, scratching upwards. Peter's claws were worn down. He was outside the tunnel, scuffling sand away. He called out that it was morning, sunrise, and that the jays were making a noise down below in the woods. Benjamin Bunny came out of the dark tunnel, shaking the sand from his ears. He cleaned his face with his paws. Every minute the sun shone warmer on the top of the hill. In the valley there was a sea of white mist, with golden tops of trees showing through. Again from the fields down below in the mist there came the angry cry of a jay, followed by the sharp yelping bark of a fox. Then those two rabbits lost their heads completely. They did the most foolish thing that they could have done. They rushed into their short new tunnel and hid themselves at the top of it, under Mr. Todd's kitchen floor. Mr. Todd was coming up bull banks, and he was in the very worst of tempers. First he had been upset by breaking the plate. It was his own fault, but it was a china plate. The last of the dinner service that had belonged to his grandmother, old Vixen Todd. Then the midges had been very bad, and he had failed to catch a hen pheasant on her nest, and it had contained only five eggs, two of them adult. Mr. Todd had had an unsatisfactory night. As usual, when out of humor, he determined to move house. First he tried the pollard willow, but it was damp, and the otters had left a dead fish near it. Mr. Todd likes nobody's leavings but his own. He made his way up the hill. His temper was not improved by noticing unmistakable marks of badger. No one else grubs up the moss so wantonly as Tommy Brock. Mr. Todd slapped his stick upon the earth and fumed. He guessed where Tommy Brock had gone to. 
He was further annoyed by the jaybird, which followed him persistently. It flew from tree to tree and scolded, warning every rabbit within hearing that either a cat or a fox was coming up the plantation. Once, when it flew screaming over his head, Mr. Todd snapped at it and barked. He approached his house very carefully with a large, rusty key. He sniffed, and his whiskers bristled. The house was locked up, but Mr. Todd had his doubts whether it was empty. He turned the rusty key in the lock. The rabbits below could hear him. Mr. Todd opened the door cautiously and went in. The sight that met Mr. Todd's eyes in Mr. Todd's kitchen made Mr. Todd furious. There was Mr. Todd's chair, and Mr. Todd's pie dish, and his knife, and fork, and mustard, and salt cellar, and his tablecloth that he had left folded up in the dresser. All set out for supper, or breakfast, without doubt for that odious Tommy Brock. There was a smell of fresh earth and dirty badger, which fortunately overpowered all smell of rabbits. But what absorbed Mr. Todd's attention was a noise, a deep, slow, regular, snoring, grunting noise coming from his own bed. He peeped through the hinges of the half-open bedroom door. Then he turned and came out of the house in a hurry. His whiskers bristled, and his coat collar stood on end with rage. For the next twenty minutes, Mr. Todd kept creeping cautiously into the house, and retreating hurriedly out again. By degrees he ventured further in, right into the bedroom. When he was outside the house, he scratched up the earth with fury, but when he was inside, he did not like the look of Tommy Brock's teeth. He was lying on his back with his mouth open, grinning from ear to ear. He snored peacefully and regularly, but one eye was not perfectly shut. Mr. Todd came in and out of the bedroom. Twice he brought in his walking stick, and once he brought in the coal scuttle. But he thought better of it and took them away. When he came back, after removing the coal scuttle, Tommy Brock was lying a little more sideways. But he seemed even sounder asleep. He was an incurably indolent person. He was not in the least afraid of Mr. Todd. He was simply too lazy and comfortable to move. Mr. Todd came back yet again into the bedroom with a clothesline. He stood a minute watching Tommy Brock and listening attentively to the snores. They were very loud indeed, but seemed quite natural. Mr. Todd turned his back towards the bed and undid the window. It creaked. He turned round with a jump. Tommy Brock, who had opened one eye, shut it hastily. The snores continued. Mr. Todd's proceedings were peculiar, and rather uneasy, because the bed was between the window and the door of the bedroom. He opened the window a little way, and pushed out the greater part of the clothesline onto the window sill. The rest of the line, with a hook at the end, remained in his hand. Tommy Brock snored conscientiously. Mr. Todd stood and looked at him for a minute. Then he left the room again. Tommy Brock opened both eyes and looked at the rope and grinned. There was a noise outside the window. Tommy Brock shut his eyes in a hurry. Mr. Todd had gone out at the front door and round to the back of the house. On the way he stumbled over the rabbit barrow. If he had had any idea who was inside it, he would have pulled him out quickly. His foot went through the tunnel, nearly upon the top of Peter Rabbit and Benjamin, but fortunately he thought that it was some more of Tommy Brock's work. 
he took up the coil of line from the sill, listened for a moment, and then tied the rope to a tree. Tommy Brock watched him with one eye through the window. He was puzzled. Mr. Todd fetched a large, heavy pailful of water from the spring and staggered with it through the kitchen into his bedroom. Tommy Brook snored industriously with rather a snort. Mr. Todd put down the pail beside the bed, took up the end of rope with the hook, hesitated, and looked at Tommy Brook. The snores were almost apoplectic, but the grin was not quite so big. Mr. Todd gingerly mounted the chair by the head of the bedstead. His legs were dangerously near to Tommy Brock's teeth. He reached up and put the end of rope with the hook over the head of the tester bed, where the curtains ought to hang. Mr. Todd's curtains were folded up and put away, owing to the house being unoccupied. So was the counterpane. Tommy Brock was covered with a blanket only. Mr. Todd, standing on the unsteady chair, looked down upon him attentively. He really was a first prize sound sleeper. It seemed as though nothing would waken him, not even the flapping rope across the bed. Mr. Todd descended safely from the chair and endeavored to get up again with a pail of water. He intended to hang it from the hook, dangling over the head of Tommy Brock, in order to make a sort of shower bath, worked by a string through the window. But naturally, being a thin-legged person, though vindictive and sandy-whiskered, he was quite unable to lift the heavy weight to the level of the hook and rope. He very nearly overbalanced himself. The snores became more and more apoplectic. One of Tommy Brock's hind legs twitched under the blanket, but still he slept on peacefully. Mr. Todd and the pail descended from the chair without accident. After considerable thought, he emptied the water into a wash basin and jug. The empty pail was not too heavy for him. He slung it up wobbling over the head of Tommy Brock. Surely there never was such a sleeper. Mr. Todd got up and down, down and up, on the chair. As he could not lift the whole pailful of water at once, he fetched a milk jug and ladled quarts of water into the pail by degrees. The pail got fuller and fuller, and swung like a pendulum. Occasionally a drop splashed over, but still Tommy Brock snored regularly and never moved, except one eye. At last Mr. Todd's preparations were complete. The pail was full of water, the rope was tightly strained over the top of the bed, and across the windowsill to the tree outside. It will make a great mess in my bedroom, but I could never sleep in that bed again without a spring cleaning of some sort, said Mr. Todd. Mr. Todd took a last look at the badger and softly left the room. He went out of the house, shutting the front door. The rabbits heard his footsteps over the tunnel. He ran round behind the house, intending to undo the rope in order to let fall the pailful of water upon Tommy Brock. I will wake him up with an unpleasant surprise, said Mr. Todd. The moment he had gone, Tommy Brock got up in a hurry. He rolled Mr. Todd's dressing gown into a bundle, put it into the bed beneath the pail of water instead of himself, and left the room also grinning immensely. He went into the kitchen, lighted a fire, and boiled the kettle. For the moment he did not trouble himself to cook the baby rabbits. When Mr. Todd got to the tree, 
he found that the weight and strain had dragged the knot so tight that it was past untying. He was obliged to gnaw it with his teeth. He chewed and gnawed for more than twenty minutes. At last the rope gave way with such a sudden jerk that it nearly pulled his teeth out and quite knocked him over backwards. Inside the house there was a great crash and splash, and the noise of a pail rolling over and over. But no screams. Mr. Todd was mystified. He sat quite still and listened attentively. Then he peeped in at the window. The water was dripping from the bed. The pail had rolled into a corner. In the middle of the bed, under the blanket, was a wet, flattened something, much dinged in, in the middle where the pail had caught it, as it were across the tummy. Its head was covered by the wet blanket, and it was not snoring any longer. There was nothing stirring, and no sound except drip-drop, drop-drip, of water trickling from the mattress. Mr. Todd watched it for half an hour. His eyes glistened. Then he cut a caper and became so bold that he even tapped at the window. But the bundle never moved. Yes, there was no doubt about it. It had turned out even better than he had planned. The pail had hit poor old Tommy Brock and killed him dead. I will bury that nasty person in the hole which he has dug. I will bring my bedding out and dry it in the sun, said Mr. Todd. I will wash the tablecloth and spread it on the grass in the sun to bleach. And the blanket must be hung up in the wind, and the bed must be thoroughly disinfected and aired with a warming pan, and warmed with a hot water bottle. I will get soft soap and monkey soap, and all sorts of soap, and soda and scrubbing brushes, and Persian powder, and carbolic, to remove the smell. I must have a disinfecting. Perhaps I may have to burn sulfur. He hurried round the house to get a shovel from the kitchen. First I will arrange the hole. Then I will drag out that person in the blanket. He opened the door. Tommy Brook was sitting at Mr. Todd's kitchen table, pouring out tea from Mr. Todd's teapot into Mr. Todd's teacup. He was quite dry himself and grinning, and he threw the cup of scalding tea all over Mr. Todd. Then Mr. Todd rushed upon Tommy Brook, and Tommy Brook grappled with Mr. Todd amongst the broken crockery, and there was a terrific battle all over the kitchen. To the rabbits underneath it sounded as if the floor would give way at each crash of falling furniture. They crept out of the tunnel and hung about amongst the rocks and bushes, listening anxiously. Inside the house the racket was fearful. The rabbit babies in the oven woke up trembling. Perhaps it was fortunate they were shut up inside. Everything was upset except the kitchen table. And everything was broken except the mantelpiece and the kitchen fender. The crockery was smashed to atoms. The chairs were broken, and the window, and the clock fell with a crash and there were handfuls of Mr. Todd's sandy whiskers. The vases fell off the mantelpiece, the canisters fell off the shelf, the kettle fell off the hob. Tommy Brook put his foot in a jar of raspberry jam, and the boiling water out of the kettle fell upon the tail of Mr. Todd. When the kettle fell, Tommy Brook, who was still grinning, happened to be uppermost. And he rolled Mr. Todd over and over like a log, out at the door. Then the snarling and worrying went on outside, 
and they rolled over the bank and downhill, bumping over the rocks. There will never be any love lost between Tommy Pock and Mr. Todd. As soon as the coast was clear, Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny came out of the bushes. Now for it. Run in, Cousin Benjamin, run in and get them, while I watch at the door. But Benjamin was frightened. Oh no, they are coming back. No, they are not. Yes, they are. What dreadful bad language. I think they have fallen down the stone quarry. Still Benjamin hesitated, and Peter kept pushing him. Be quick, it's all right. Shut the oven door, Cousin Benjamin, so that he won't miss them. Decidedly, there were lively doings in Mr. Todd's kitchen. At home, in the rabbit hole, things had not been quite comfortable. After quarreling at supper, Flopsy and old Mr. Bouncer had passed a sleepless night, and quarreled again at breakfast. Old Mr. Bouncer could no longer deny that he had invited company into the rabbit hole, but he refused to reply to the questions and reproaches of Flopsy. The day passed heavily. Old Mr. Bouncer, very sulky, was huddled up in a corner, barricaded with a chair. Flopsy had taken away his pipe and hidden the tobacco. She had been having a complete turnout and spring cleaning to relieve her feelings. She had just finished. Old Mr. Bouncer, behind his chair, was wondering anxiously what she would do next. In Mr. Todd's kitchen, amongst the wreckage, Benjamin Bunny picked his way to the oven nervously. Through a thick cloud of dust, he opened the oven door, felt inside, and found something warm and wriggling. He lifted it out carefully and rejoined Peter Rabbit. I've got them. Can we get away? Shall we hide, Cousin Peter? Peter pricked his ears. Distant sounds of fighting still echoed in the wood. Five minutes afterwards, two breathless rabbits came scuttering away down bull banks, half carrying, half dragging a sack between them, bumpity bump over the grass. They reached home safely and burst into the rabbit hole. Great was old Mr. Bouncer's relief and Flopsy's joy when Peter and Benjamin arrived in triumph with the young family. The rabbit babies were rather tumbled and very hungry. They were fed and put to bed. They soon recovered. A long new pipe and freshly supply of rabbit tobacco was presented to Mr. Bouncer. He was rather upon his dignity, but he accepted. Old Mr. Bouncer was forgiven, and they all had dinner. Then Peter and Benjamin told their story, but they had not waited long enough to be able to tell the end of the battle between Tommy Brook and Mr. Todd.